10 bucks. Well, as long as uh, the ninth most powerful man in the music business is making 10 bucks on bets, I, I think that's a good way to start. Now, I'm trying to put this into time. What, what year did you find yourself slipping into the uh, morass, the tar pits of the music business? 82, I took a chem class at UCSD. I was going to be a nice Jewish doctor. And, um, you were, still could be. There were 35 Chinese kids in the class who all had tiger moms, which crushed Jewish moms. And um, <laughs> I was running the campus record store, radio station, and events committee, and didn't really realize I was into music. And uh, I got my ass handed to me in the class. And <clears throat> I was also a baseball player. That one of the guys on the baseball team said, hey, you're pretty good at this concert thing. Let's start a company. He was from a rich family. We started a company. It went kablooey. And I never looked back. And it was a happy accident. It, it, it went kablooey good or kablooey bad? Kablooey huge, good, incredible. And uh, from there, where did it take you? I moved to LA day after graduation. and. I just told this to Michael. Um, I think I was 20 years old. I was infatuated with music. I flew to England. I signed the Smiths, Suck on the Bunnymen, New Order. I'd had Didn't you sign any good bands? No. I have terrible taste. And came well, home. Well, slow down. So New Order, Echo and the Bunnymen, the Smiths. and the Smiths. And I had the church. I was managing them as a hobby. Oh, God. I oh, love I the love, church, I too. I love the church. Unguarded moment, my uh, friend. Un uh, unbelievable record. Next two were even better. Blur, uh, Crusade, and Seance. Yeah. Never came out here. Um, anyway, and then it just went, choo, and every cool indie band in the 80s got lucky enough to work with, and then had everything from the Nine Inch Nails and James Addictions, blah, blah, and then Lollapalooza came up out of a Reading Festival incident that's now kind of storied. I was in England with the band. They canceled. We went down. We said, they were looking for something to do. I said, let's do a festival. And we're back in the hotel. They said, great idea. Let's do it. And, you know, six weeks later, Perry calls me up at one in the morning out of his mind wasted. I got the name. OK, what is it? Lollapalooza. What? <laughs> what? I saw it on Three Stooges episode. It's great. It means something great. OK, okay no problem. Let's go. So you know that became something. And then I that left. That became something? Well, it was interesting. <laughs> Uh, l let me just throw this out to you, Mark. Uh, having run into Perry Farrell at uh, WXRT over the years, and I have a feeling the uh, the origins of, of Lollapalooza and how it came together and how it was executed, that uh, a certain uh, Mr. Geiger did a lot of the heavy lifting. We stay in the background. <laughs> okay. You and said Michael Perry Farrell to our and radio the tour, station. We stay in the background. Okay. But anyway, it went pretty well and you know it happened to have some good timing nirvana you know there was some timing involved which didn't happen with artist direct and then i went to run a record company because i got bored of the agency thing and i worked with rick rubin for five years and that was kind of interesting whether it's tom petty chili peppers johnny cash you know it was really fascinating rick time. rubin uh, actually uh, a guy who reinvented a he's number fantastic. of careers he's brilliant and a good friend and then um I saw this thing coming. I was a geek and an engineering guy, and I had a really good friend who, in answer to Fitz's thing from before, I'll just I digress for two seconds and tell you a story. My college roommate, one of my college roommates, was a real early internet innovator, like early. I was early, early. He was really early. He was Neanderthal early. And he moved to New York in the late 80s, was writing newsletters about interactive home, and when CompuServe, Prodigy, Delphi were the services. AOL wasn't even launched yet. There was no internet. And I got into it through him, and he turned to me one day and said, you don't understand the music business, dude. And I go, what are you talking about? He said, the fifth member of the band is going to be a webmaster. Now, that wasn't the word he used. Instead of Michael's thing, because you have to do social media, right? Um, and he said that every artist in the future is going to have, as part of their sidekick or group, somebody to manage social media or outgoing and incoming communications. I am fits in the tantrums online, but behind the screen, it's Michael can rest a little bit, write a song, and have somebody else post, right? And it was interesting. It brought that to mind. And when I started Artist Direct, the first thing we did, besides grabbing the domain names, creating the official website, business, and stores, was to get fan webmasters to be alongside of the artist. And I just came in from. New York, where I had Nine Inch Nails playing, and one of the, he's a genius, and a, also a genius at technology, social Trent. media, et cetera, Trent's fantastic. But he has a sidekick nobody knows about called Rob Sheridan, who is that guy, 
who's not only an artistic guy, but he is brilliant in managing all of the, all of that, posting, social media, whatever it is. So it's a real focus, because it's a big job. I would say Michael understated how big it is, because it also sucks you in. You read that stuff, and you start to think, do my songs suck? <laughs> <You know? Right. laughs> Somebody hated it. You know, it's one guy and 20 others. So I digress, but it was an interesting... Well, that's not a digression at all. That's all part of it. It was an interesting time, and that whole artist direct thing, or I would say version 1.0 of the internet, which would be 94 to maybe the crash in 2000, was nuts. And I've never been part of anything like that in my life, the hyper growth, the hyper decline, the, hi the, the change. And ultimately, what was became my passion was I had a good view of how badly organized the music business was. I used to compare it to London. And if you've ever tra traveled to London or Venice, Italy, they are pretty impossible to navigate as cities because there's no grid like Chicago, okay? Right. There's the streets called one thing, it Across the street's called another thing. It's changed, you know, it's nuts. Because they built it, they said, oh, we need another road over here. We'll put it here. So that's how the music business was organized. And it was a disaster. And what happened was, as, as this digital world started to come in, you could redesign it and make it work and make it all work and make it interesting. And that became sort of a passion. And right now, you fast forward from probably 92, when I sort of started on this journey, to now, I had lunch with David Byrne yesterday and we were talking about that article he wrote about Spotify and you know, and he's wrong and we talked about it and why, but the point really <laughs> now, is. Now, what did he say about Spotify and what was he You should probably about? go read the article, but he basically said at this point, artists aren't gonna make money and he confused a bunch of issues, including really not understanding the scale of how the economics work. But he started to write about artists getting screwed over. And what I, <laughs> the beauty of the digital world is 70% of the money goes into the top with log files which means, like your cell phone, you know everything that's played by everybody right. and you get paid and it's very clear for the first time. Then it goes into the record company Meat Grinder and they jumble it up and play Confusicat and give you a statement and you go, what happened to all that money? And he was writing about that. And I, anyway, we, we talked through it, but we're now in an era where people are finally getting to a decent music model, which is gonna be really good for everybody here. And when you started, you said, you know, the music business is over, and God, all this stuff. And the interesting part is, is it's bigger than ever. Right. By five times? And I would go on record, and I've done so, to say that, and just for those of you that know, the record business, which is often called the music business, it's not, but it's called that, is a $27 billion business. And when Napster hit, it was 40. And it went down to 20 because of piracy and all the other stuff which was great, by the way. That was free music and training everybody to learn how to use digital equipment and, and take their music digitally. It's now back up to 27. I think it goes to 200. So 200, 200 billion. billion dollars just on record in publishing. Now, my little business, which is pretty big live business, Mike was referring to, is, um, has grown three times as a result of the internet. Because, you know, he talks about flying all over the world. Well, those records weren't necessarily released all over the world. They certainly weren't hits all over the world, but right. somehow there's audiences there. So I travel all over the world. I go to our new Lollapaloozas in Chile or Brazil or Argentina or whatever. We take an artist down who has not only never been there, has never gotten a royalty statement, doesn't know if their record was released, hits the stage, there's 10,000 people singing every word. Now how does that happen? YouTube, right, or whatever. So I think this has been a, it's been a fantastic change, but if you don't work in the industry, from the outside, you get kind of a layman's view of the change. But the change in this industry is so radical that it's the equivalent of literally wiping out Chicago, moving it to Grand Rapids, rebuilding it, with completely different things, buildings, streets. Please don't do that. I won't. I love Chicago. I came I, here for this. I, I love understand. Chicago. But that's the equivalent. And when I public speak and give speeches, I will put up all the brands that existed in the 90s, right? MTV being one of them. And I'll start this thing about change and Ma Bell and all this stuff and I go into and the slide shows it because it shows all the brands. They're gone. And today's brands, then you say, okay, today. And it's iTunes, it's YouTube, it's you know, Amazon, it's what have you. It's Facebook. And those brands didn't exist at that time at all. So it's wholesale replacement. Everything's wholesale change and TV's about to go through it. So it's been a fascinating time. If you wanna be in this industry, it's kind of fun when all this change is going on. I don't know if it's fun if you're on the side that is hanging on for dear life. Right. 
But if you make that leap and you say, oh, this new, it's going to be great, it's going to be bigger, and it is, because you have a Spotify account in your iPhone, it's plugged in your car, you get anything you want, that's worse than going to a record store paying 11 bucks for the one, no, it's not worse. So um, it's been an interesting few years. You're not a romantic who uh, feels like you have to hold a record album in your hand and look at the cover of Santana's Abraxas and go, what the hell's going on here? No, I'm the guy that wanted the more metadata of who influenced Santana and now can find it online, <laughs> right? So, no, not at all. Uh, well, I sold my CDs and albums a long time ago. You, you sold your records and your CDs. Done. I, I, why, why, my wife is in the audience. I have 5,000 CDs and 6,000 records. Sell. <laughs> Quick. They're Don't about to listen go to, nothing. to him. Just because he, he's more powerful than I am. He has no time to alphabetize them. Ask him to find <laughs> 10 records. He won't find them. Well, and wait, then you a minute, wait a minute. Mention a record. Some of them I can find. Some, Some. of them Some. are alphabetized. Yeah, you have well, all that time to alphabetize them. I, I know. don't have a lot of time to alphabetize. One of the things you touched on, which I find fascinating, because I was there when this was happening, you're talking about judging how an artist is doing, how the record is going up the charts, how is it doing at retail. And I can tell you from personal experience how radio stations would do retail reports. They'd call some stoner at uh, Rose Records and say, how's this doing? That's Ooh, doing really man. good. And you'd write down like a number, like a coded number. And, you know, you'd pass that along to the record company. There was all this opportunity for fudging everything. I mean, everybody looks at the billboard charts as some sacred tablets that Moses brought down from the mountain. Well, a lot of that stuff was shucked and jived right to the top. Hey, that's how artist royalty statements are now. You know, when BMI and ASCAP pay, it's arbitrary. I'm not kidding. Well, what it is is, well, at least no, the radio stations, they take they two arbitron, weeks. Arbitron now. They take two weeks. BDS. And right. they telescope that over the entire year. I know. Just between you and me. Don't tell anybody here. But when we used to have to fill it out before it was all computerized, um, I remember I would seek the most obscure bands to play during those two weeks. So I'd say, Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers need a royalty statement. Road runner, I'm going to play Road Runner, Road, road runner, 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 going 60 miles an hour. I'm going to make stuff happen. My man. In Albany, New York, I'm changing the course of musical history on a daily basis here. We don't even look at those charts, ever. Now it's replaced by Shazam charts, Facebook, Next Big Sound, Blended This, So-and-So Likes, How Many Video Views, and the amalgamation of data and how you look at it and what it means. I was with Pandora the other day and Shazam, blah, 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 and the Pandora guys are sitting there going, no, our data's better. Why? Because we get thumbs up and thumbs down. So we actually know what people like. See, if somebody buys something or listens to something, it doesn't mean they like it. YouTube views, you can get a lot of views. Doesn't mean they like it, doesn't mean they go buy a ticket, doesn't mean they go follow the artist, they saw it. It was interesting, because I didn't think about it. Shazam, ah, thumb up, an actual affirmative action. Buying a ticket is definitely an affirmative right. action, right? So we're in this age where data's transitioning and trying to figure out what's what, but it's certainly not you know, BDS and now, or was, SoundScan that actually took the juju out of it and made it sort of real. Right. Because I also know record store clerks, sound scan good, I'll scan five of them, you know, and our store's weighted, so uh, now it's 50 sales. Um, it's, it's another big change. Well, listen, we have, we have like two minutes. Get started seconds. then, hurry. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, 120 seconds for you to tell me how today do musicians through all of this make money? Okay, there's more money to make than ever before is the first thing. One, you need elbow grease. Michael talked about that, all right? That's, that's real, okay? Two, I think when Mike comes up, he'll probably talk about YouTube or some portion of that, right? That's another way. By the way, YouTube, when a record's played on XRT, there's three ads, next record's played, nobody gets the ads except for XRT. In the digital world, those ads are played, Michael gets 50, or the song's played, he gets 50% of the ad, okay? That's great. So number one, this massive advertising business is now rev shared with artists. So that's number one. So if you can drive impressions in the new digital world, you can actually earn money. Didn't happen before, it was just a hope that it would sell you records, right. okay? Number two, there's globalization. YouTube and those bands I talked about in Chile, take fits down to Argentina and Chile, they'll get paid whatever, they're gonna play in front of all these people, they're like, why are we getting this much? 
It's because of what had happened. Their earnings are across more cities. That's on the live thing. Three, as streaming comes in, which is really going to happen, and people have less barrier to listen, $1.99, $1.29, whatever it is, 99 cents on iTunes, Amazon, whatever, you're gonna, listening is going to go up. And the streaming rates are going to start to scale, and it's going to mean real money. You're, there's probably, and more people are using music, clubs, like uh, restaurants, whatever, and you can actually collect it now, in a, in a way. So there's a number of ways, and there's probably about five others I'm leaving out, but those are all sort of improved because of the digital world. So if you can get people to come out, see your band play, fill the metro, uh, get some hits on YouTube, there's a career for you. I think there's more bands breaking than ever before. I think everybody who talks about the music business as being, oh, whatever, is reading ridiculous reporters who don't understand what's going on. People say to me, oh, there's no big arena bands anymore because they think about the who not playing right. arenas. Okay? They don't realize Taylor Swift just played and Kenny Chesney just played and Rihanna just played and Bruno Mars just sold that. Well, ah! Well, it's like I was saying. You know, if you think there's no good music being made, that there's no commerce in music, then you've shut yourself down. It's bigger than ever, and all I'll say to leave, because I know we're out of time, is I think that it grows five to ten times from here. Wow. So if you are going to get into the arts, whatever it is. And TV is about to go through, the next 10 years is gonna be as, as interesting and exciting. Um, and you're smart, and by the way, you're good, because as Michael said, you cannot get people interested in stuff that's not good and doesn't react. You make more money than ever. It, and remember, we were in a temporary bit of a slide, and now it's gonna go like this. So it's gonna be very interesting in the next few years. Mark Geiger here at Chicago Ideas. Hey, Mark. Hey, Lynn. Really sorry the doctor thing never worked out for you, but, you know, I'll good things some, in the future. I'll do some out in the hallway. Cheap. Mark, thanks very much for being here. Mark Geiger.